Thank you for joining us for the May Gate Equity Webinar. I'm Kathy Anderson, OSBI Graduation Equity Program Supervisor. Today's topic is an introduction to Washington's social emotional learning standards and benchmarks. And we chose this topic because at this moment in history, we could all use a little bit more information on what social emotional learning standards are. And Washington has taken the time to adopt some social emotional learning standards. So these could help uh, school staff, students, and families across the state. And we hope you'll get some ideas on how to adapt these for your own context, whether that's with your own family, while virtually teaching, or for yourself. And this webinar is brought to you through the Office of System and School Improvement. Uh, by the end of the webinar today, we want you to walk away with some ideas about social emotional learning, about why it's important, and we want to give you some exposure to the standards. With COVID-19, we're all making adjustments, and we hope you also get some ideas sparked for how these standards might take effect in your own context. We do have North Mason School District here to talk about how they're implementing supports and you'll get a chance to ask questions on what it really looks like. Of course, we always offer resources to help you get started. I am so lucky. I'm joined today by Tammy Boland. She is OSPI's Social Emotional Learning Program Supervisor, and she's brought with her North Mason's Jessica Collins. I'm really glad that we get a chance to share. We're gonna move along to Tammy. So Tammy, you're here. You're awesome. Tell us a little bit about you. All right. Well, first, thank you for being here. I just want to introduce myself before I launch into SEL. Here are some pictures of my family and friends and coworkers. I'm from Alaska and I began my education career as a high school English and teacher, uh, German teacher. I taught for about 10 years and then I went into a career in the corporate world. And after about 10 years of that, I decided that I really wanted some meaning back in my life and to make a difference. And so I came back into education. In 2015, so you'll see this picture behind that poll. 2015, I started work at the Nevada Department of Education in School Improvement, and then became the director of Gear Up College Readiness Grant. And that's me, I won uh, Professional of the Year in 2017. And I love that, but I couldn't pass up the opportunity to come to Washington to work in helping promote and expand SEL because that is a love of mine. Here's my other two loves right there, my daughter and my horsies. So with that said, let's talk about why we should focus on SEL. What is, but let's first talk about the definition. So this is the definition that the work group, the SEL work group came up with. It's slightly different than CASEL. And it is a process through which people build awareness and skills in managing emotions, setting goals, establishing relationships, and making responsible decisions that support success in school and in life. So, is, so managing emotions, let me reiterate this, setting goals, establishing relationships, and making responsible decisions. Is there anyone in the audience who doesn't think that that's important? Uh, so why should we focus on SEL? As a former English teacher, did anyone weather the storms with uh, diagramming sentences? And, or how about knowing the difference between romanticism and historical fiction? No, that's right, because what we lean on in times of trouble or to weather storms or to achieve success are those SEL skills. So you just helped me answer why SEL skills are important. Take a look at this stat. Two, a third of our jobs our elementary students will have are beyond our imagination right now. So how do we know what academics to teach them, what skills to teach them? So we know that for this reason, we don't just teach academics. We want to teach the skills that are crucial to navigate not just the workplace, but life. Take a look at this list. This is put together by business leaders that I, I believe it was Google that actually surveyed all these Fortune 500 companies. And they put together a list of 13 skills. Notice all of these skills. And these are important in, in order of importance. So you have teamwork, problem solving, interpersonal skills, personal development, leadership, motivation, all of those. 
very few of those skills are actually academic. The majority by far are SEL skills. And then you identify the skills, the SEL skills that it takes for you to weather the storms. And those, they were all SEL skills. So let's look at how we weather this storm that we're dealing with right now with COVID-19 and the implications there are around that. So there are a lot of funny things happening that are coming out and uh, I put down a couple. Homeschooling is just, is going just great. Two kids suspended for fighting and one teacher fired for drinking on the job. And then Ben, it's not going good. My mom's getting stressed out. My mom is really getting confused. We took a break so my mom can figure this out, this stuff out. And I'm telling you, it is not going good. There are lots of really funny memes and gifs and going out there. But on a serious note, we don't know the impact that this will have on our students. There are so many things happening with this pandemic, pandemic-related fears, anxieties, and worries. We have changes or, or a lack of routine that often impacts sleep, concentration, memory, attention, emotions. We have social distancing that is creating isolation, and that's related to social connections. We have an increased screen time that can impact sleep, the brain chemicals, and relationships. We have challenging family dynamics, and we have loss. And this is, these things combined are a recipe for trauma. And this is why, more than ever, SEL and trauma-informed practices and connections should be in the forefront of educators' minds. So trauma... Trauma is essentially something our nervous system does not have the psychological capacity to navigate. It's an experience that is encountered that makes you feel out of control. And then that makes you disconnected from that sense of resourcefulness or safety or coping or love that you typically feel. So it's important to note that you don't want to minimize anyone's experience our response to trauma because it's very relative, it's subjective, and there are differences as, a, as unique and as varied as our different nervous systems. We should validate our own experiences to be compassionate to ourselves and that of others. So during this time, it's imperative we understand that trauma may affect a student's ability to cope with their emotions, and this will affect students' ability to learn. To learn more about trauma, in the resources slide, there is a, the SEL modules, and there's an entire section on trauma in that module. Those are free. Uh, that link is... And then there's ACEs, Adverse Childhood Events. So we're dealing with students, families, parents. Everyone is dealing with, with this pandemic, which could be possible trauma. And it's also been important to understand that adverse childhood experiences or ACEs and the prevalence of that there is a high prevalence of these. There's a tremendous amount of research that shows that what we experience in childhood impacts our mental and physical trajectories into adulthood. So ACE and ACEs are common. Two thirds of people have an ACE. The higher the ACE score, the more likely you are to experience the neg negative mental and physical impact. Although even just one ACE can, can put you on that mental, negative mental and physical health trajectory. And recently, I just heard from a, counsel a counselor that it's estimated that a student will come out of COVID with at least one ACE. If you look at this data, you'll see that the CDC did a study of 214,000 people surveyed them and it shows that some groups of people are affected more than others it's important to understand that aces don't just affect the person but also the community so why are seo skills important to washington students for now let's look at the data that shows how washington students are feeling so you'll see this is the two, this is 2018 healthy youth survey data for eighth 10th and 12th graders. So all of this data is for the 8th, 10th, and 12th graders. So you'll see 37 to 41% of students feel sad or hopeless. The word being hopeless. 53% of students felt anxious and on edge. 20% of the students said they didn't feel safe at school. 
and 50% of students felt that they had, a, they had an adult that they could talk to when feeling sad or hopeless. In addition, we've seen that bullying in 10th grade, we know that bullying affects students with their grades. So you saw that a comparison between kids who weren't bullied and who are also had lower grades, CDs and Fs. And I just want to point out that we have 50% of students who feel that they can go to an adult, but that means that 50% of the students don't feel like they have someone that they can go to when they're feeling fat, sad, or hopeless. And this is the suicidal feelings and actions questions around this, also in the survey, also for 8th, 10th, and 12th graders. So you're looking at kids who considered attempting suicide in the past year, again, 2018 data, was between 20 and 23%. 16 to 18% made a plan to commit suicide and 10%, 9 and 10% respectively, attempted suicide in 2018. Then you add the coronavirus and the stressors that, that uh, go around this with possible job loss of parent, you know, parents dealing with job loss and the stress that that entails, possible homelessness. We've got possible loss of friends or family members. We definitely we know, how, know we have social isolation. This is crucial to understand that we already had 10% of our students trying to commit suicide the number is going to go up because of the trauma, because of how this has impacted kids, unless we get supports in there. So there is good news that SEL can help. Let's look at the research. So SEL, when done with fidelity, there are some amazing things that this research shows. It increases the interest in learning. It improves attitudes about self and others and it increases social emotional skills, as well as improves classroom behavior, boosts academic performance. Right now, the starred bullets or points are what I think are probably most crucial. And this is from a meta-analysis that look, here's the kicker, it decreases emotional stress. So I highlighted a few of these because I think these impacts prepare students to concentrate and stay on task and work effectively with others. We know that kids are going to need this. We know that kids are at a higher risk right now, risk factor, and SEL pro pro provides that protective mechanism. Let's look at what Washington's doing around SEL. The great thing about Washington is that there is a great amount of legislative support and that support has gone on since 2015 and actually there was work far before that as well but in 2015 there was a legislatively mandated work group that started working on standards and benchmarks understand that on our website the SEL OSPI website which is also identified in the resources slide there is a plethora of information. There's the modules link, there's the implementation guide link, there's the standards, benchmarks, and indicators all on there. And so the amazing work that has created an SEL framework to help implement the SEL and educational practices. One of these tools that was produced is the standards. And those standards were adopted by OSPI on January 1st, 2020. So why are the standards and benchmarks and indicators important? Because they provide a framework to look at how you're teaching SEL skills and those competencies and to make sure that you're teaching them all. Some curriculums out there just don't cover all six of the standards, which we are gonna go over very quickly. Here are the standards. You'll see self-awareness and self-management, and self-efficacy we've got so those that's a little different than the castle five then we have social awareness social management and social engagement these are all tier one supports which means it is for all students in there there are lots of activities that can be done for all students there are curriculums out there again that emphasize two or three of the standards, but not all six. Again, these standards offer that framework 
And the indicators offer those a guideline to looking at how students may meet those. With that said, through during coronavirus, we know that these arrowed standards are the ones that we're probably going to be emphasizing because of social distancing. So understanding your emotions, understanding how to manage those emotions, and how to motivate yourself during this time. So those are all key. When we think about implementing SEL into programs, there are three essential elements. And that is creating conditions to support SEL. So that's creating a positive culture and climate, infusing SEL into policies and practices, working in collaboration, that's with families, educators, youth serving organizations from planning, implement, implementation, and review, and then building adult capacity, providing that PD. I, I just received a question this morning, how do I get teachers on board? Providing that PD, because if you know that this is the need and the benefits of what SEL does. I don't know how you can't buy into it. It improves academic skills. It reduces classroom misconduct. And then it allows kids to build these skills that we know na help them navigate throughout life. In addition, Washington State SEL is shaped by the commitment to the following four guiding principles. Equity, being culturally responsive, universal design, and being trauma-informed. So when we talk about SEL, when we're thinking how to integrate SEL, we recommend that it's integrated into the MTSS framework. It really is about understanding that SEL should be intentionally embedded into teaching into the, and into the culture, the school culture. It's very effective as standalone. It isn't very effective as a standalone. So where a counselor comes in and does 30 minutes or you have one teacher that provides the SEL for all of the grades, that is not as near, nearly as effective. So the, the benefits that you receive, those are done when a teacher, the classroom teacher, provides these SEL skills. And the thing is, you're probably already doing this. So it's just a matter of doing it intentionally. The other thing about MTSS integrating that is understanding and trying to determine how, how will you assess, not test, not grade, not penalize, but to determine if the student has a need for additional help in a particular school so that there needs to be some thought around that. So COVID-19, there needs to be strengthening of the SEL skills for ourselves and for our students. Because goodness knows if, if a teacher doesn't have those skills. So I want you to think, is everyone you know, is, do you know anyone that might need those SEL skills? And my guess is probably yes. And so strengthening our own SEL skills so that we can provide and model those for our students. The second thing is school connectedness around relationships and climate trauma-informed practices, and then predictability and consistency around expectations and routines. So those are all keys that I think need to be strengthened right now. So a couple ideas to help students identify and manage their, their emotions. Brene Brown, there's a quote that says, transformational leaders and teachers have a deep understanding of their own emotional landscape and the landscape of others. In her new podcast, I highly recommend. We know that kids learn by observation and repetition and imitation. They are watching us. And so we need to make sure we're modeling and teaching these skills, which means we need to have these skills. So, so getting seeking professional development is imperative. And then we spend a lot of time and energy on teaching whole host, a whole host of academic skills, but not often explicitly teach our students one of the most foundational skills around mental health and well-being, which is social emotional learning. When we look at some strategies, we have pause and check in. The stress and trauma we're experiencing right now, may really impact our nervous system systems and our ability how we actually want to respond instead of responding from the amygdala which provides us our our fight flight freezer fawn response so we really want to follow these steps to intentionally help our nervous system to calm down and reset so first being we want to pause and check in 
my paw, my pause and check in is deep breathing. So we can do this anytime that helps us react and respond wisely. Pausing and taking some deep breaths can buy us some time to reset our nervous system. The second thing is name it to tame it. You'll probably have heard this if you if you've done SEL curriculum. There's a lot of studies that show that even don't, adults don't have a broad vocabulary for identifying our emotions or emotions in others. So we stick to the same three to five emotions instead of broadening the vocabulary to properly identify what we're feeling. Because feelings are information, they're sing sig signals from the brain to get your attention around something. And when you don't validate that by say, let's say self-talk, okay, I'm feeling really anxious right now, then your brain is going to keep intensifying that emotion until it gets really uncomfortable. So when you can identify the emotion, it will allow your brain to let go and move on. So it's important to name it to tame it. And then the next slide talks about using a feeling chart. Using this feeling chart can help with this, with the naming it. Having it at home or in the classroom or whatever setting you're in working is, is just a reminder to check in. So thinking in terms of practicing these skills and modeling and teaching these skills, you don't have to just do this when you're uncomfortable or feeling upset. Doing this when you feel good is good modeling and will help develop those skills to be able to broaden your emotional vocabulary and increase your capacity to navigate your emotions and knowing really that we need to be intentional about our own self-care. So when students are under stress, it's difficult to verbalize or even be aware of how they're feeling. Utilizing a feeling chart for your younger students or establishing, say, a rating scale. We do that at my house. So if my daughter and I are both working, we do a rating scale when she comes in and so that we have an understanding. And within the classroom, it's useful to know where the students are starting and giving them those those that possible time to reset. This feeling chart there, all you have to do is Google feeling charts. And I found that one on this one. When you're working around students, utilizing the feeling charts, it's going to approach learning and identify if there's a need for some prior work to reset and to get those students in the right frame of mind. And one way to do that is through the bliss list. So this is, um, Something I learned, uh, it's fantastic. I've heard them called happy lists or be happy lists. And these are just an example. This is a list of things you can think of or do to soothe your nervous system. There's three things that should be on every bliss list. One is breathing. So deep breaths because we can, when we are in the amyg amygdala response, when it's an, in, an, in an uncomfortable state, our bodies send the oxygen to our arms and our legs, our extremities, because it's sensing danger. And it doesn't understand that there's a difference between danger, danger with a tiger about to eat us or an uncomfortable, uh, unpleasant feeling that we're having. So it doesn't distinguish that difference. So taking a moment to breathe will allow that oxygen and it gives you a second for that nervous system to settle. The second thing is movement. So you'll see I have breathing on mine. This first list is my bliss list. So the second thing is movement. So much research shows that movement, our bodies are wired for movement. So dance in the bedroom, go for a walk, whatever it is that you enjoy, go for a run, wiggle my legs. So that was, that was from a um, elementary school. Um, they like to sit in their chairs and wiggle their legs really fast. That helps that fuzzy energy and that anxiety to move through you. And then the third thing that should be on everyone is every list, bliss list, is positive self-talk. It's really important that we understand that there are things that are going on in our brains when we're feeling these feelings that, and it might be like right now, boy, am I stumbling through my words. Wow, wow, am I saying um? And so I'm evaluating this every minute as I'm speaking and uh, because I'm nervous, because I have that buzzy energy. So being aware of positive self-talk, I can get through this. And then two things that should not be on a list. Vices, because we want this list to be something you can do anytime to reset your nervous system. Vices, so drinking, drugs, gambling, none of those should be on there. <laughs> And then screen time. 
So that's, there's so much research around screen time that shows that shows that um, the brain just doesn't relax enough. It's too active to reset and to process. So what it does is distract instead. And again, going back to the, the brain is trying to signal when you're feeling anxiety that you want to address it and name it. And so if you're just distracting, it's just going to keep building that up. Those are a couple of strategies that you can use and then tips that provide consistency and structure. So that is key because so students know their expectations. Being flexible right now, so this is now and when we re-enter, being flexible. And then for goodness sakes, focusing on that connection. We know that there is going to be this incredible desire to make up the academic loss and understanding that if kids aren't in the right set of mind, if they have experienced trauma and they are walking in, connection is key. So building these SEL skills proactively <laughs> up front and really focusing on those, the very, uh, will, will help in the long run. I know it seems like taking a break, and stepping back, but it really will. I mean, we know it, it decreases the misconduct. We know it increases their interest in learning. We know it increases their academics. So these are key. Focusing on that connection, building the S, these SEL skills is imperative. Model and practice self-care. So in the classroom, when you're feeling upset, modeling these out loud so that they see how you're handling this. And then validate experiences, allow platforms for all voices. Do you know anything about how social emotional learning is being funded and if that funding is continuing into next year? So right now, there is not specific funding for SEL. There is a funding pot of money for my position that works with the SEL advisory that is happening right now. That is, and our goal is to expand and promote. It's a very small pot of money. And the hope is that this advisory, as we put out the recommendations and help provide the professional development and get people to understand why it's important, we hope to put a recommendation in. To, so we have a legislative report that we'll have to do each year starting next summer where we'll make these recommendations. And so the, the hope is that these recommendations will be seen and that there's support. But my goodness, talk to your representatives and about SEL if that's what you believe in, because it is really, really crucial to, to our students. Um, another question that came up is that you were talking about your bliss list and yeah. people missed the first thing that you said. Do you happen to remember what the bliss list as far as deep breaths the the things that are required on it so this is this is something that a teacher should walk students through to do and to help them with those bliss lists and that deep breaths should be the first thing on there because this really does help soothe your nervous system and you can use this at any time so in the in the bliss list may look differently in the classroom and then it's not a bad idea to help students build one for home too, especially right now. And then even talk to parents on how to use those. So taking a minute, let's say you're in the middle of teaching a lesson and you could stop and say, hey, look, I'm feeling a little frustrated right now. And maybe you point to that, that feeling chart. And because I'm, I'm noticing there's a lot of students that are off task. So let's take a moment to look at your bliss list and maybe do that self-talk about focusing and being present. And let's take a minute to resettle and focus. And I'll do the same thing to take some deep breaths to calm myself down. And so you're modeling that and it, it's very useful because that's how kids, we know the pathways, the modeling and seeing that in action builds those pathways from the amygdala to that frontal cortex where we have those higher level thinking skills. We're going to head over to Jessica and Jessica's going to tell us about how this looks in her classroom over in North Mason School District. So Jessica, tell us a little bit more. Hi everybody. I'm really excited to be here. I'm going to start out with telling you just a little bit about myself. I am first and foremost, a wife and a mom. That's a picture of my two kids, Ethan and Grace. When my youngest, Ethan, was in first grade, 
I took a para position in our local district in an elementary school, and I fell completely in love with teaching and nurturing the whole child and just really looking at them as leaders. And it spearheaded me, and I have just, I, at 40, decided to go back and get my bachelor's degree in education. And then I haven't stopped. I'm now working on my second master's degree in administration, and I am in an amazing classroom, third grade classroom. There's a picture of my kiddos. They are fantastic. I adore them. I want to talk about North Mason as a whole and why we came to find out that we really need to integrate SEL into our classrooms. And honestly, the data is somewhat dismal, but we have to face it. And here it is. 38% of our students at Sand Hill Elementary met the ELA standards on their SBA. 24% of our students as a whole in the district are at risk on their Saber screener. And 50% of our students in North Mason are low income and 14% of them are English language learners. I think that the piece that makes me really believe in delivering SEL in the classroom and integrating is Mason County has the highest prevalence of ACEs in the whole in Washington state. And it's directly reflected in my kids. I see it every day. And so I am passionate about this. And today I am going to talk to you about what it looks like in my classroom. I first wanna start with letting you know that our district made this commitment. They looked at the data, they faced the realization that we were living in. They made a commitment to build an MTSS system for the whole child. Once they made that con commitment, they released the leadership to the building leadership teams and the teams were supported in leading this work in each building. They then created blueprints that were individualized for each individual school. And it really hit academics, behavior, and SEL in the classroom. And all three tiers of support were layered in. In our school, this is what our three tiers look like. For everyone, universal tier one, we have a second step curriculum, an SEL curriculum that is delivered and integrated into the classroom. We have daily greetings at the front door, daily classroom circles, calming spaces, a reboot system, and we have PBIS school-wide. This is for the all. And in North Mason, we talk lots about our triangle is flipped. Our 80% is the most needy. So we have layers that we add in the classroom, but this is what we deliver to all. Our tier two is our targeted piece, and we do some small group SEL instruction. We have check-in, check-outs, breaks are better, recess academy, lunch bunch with the counselor. And then students that this doesn't meet their needs and they need another layer, we have personalized tier three instruction, which includes individualized counseling, school-based community health. We have Consejo, BHR, and then our local community health services are very involved as well and individualized support plans. So here are my kids again, they're amazing. And I am going to tell you, actually, they really helped um, prepare this, to tell you what it looks like for us to live SEL in our classroom. So the first thing that I wanted to start out with was creating a classroom environment because this kind of falls on teachers, I think. This is work that you do maybe in the fall before school starts. This might be work right now, that we are doing before we start a Zoom meeting. I really like to create a classroom environment that really nurtures learning. I use strategic lighting. I feel like it creates a calm, safe space that they feel like it's welcoming. I like to develop clear, identified student learning areas. And this might include a place where a specific student likes to go to do their math. I wanna make sure that the visual prompts that are on the walls reflect the learning areas in the classroom as well. And you can kind of see in the pictures how I've done that. If someone's going to go independently work on their reading, I wanna make sure that the tools that they need to help them independently learn are on the wall. I am a huge believer in creating these tool tools with the students, making sure that they have a voice in their learning and the tools that they're going to use. The most important pieces that I think need to be on everybody's wall are the visual prompts that guide them in their day for their behaviors. 
We have adopted three personal standards in North Mason. Those are show respect, solve problems, and make good decisions. And every morning we pledge to do these in our classroom. And this, this is our PBIS, PBIS expectations, the school-wide, but it's very visual in everyone's classrooms. I really want to make sure that my kids, first day they walk in the door, I let them know that this is a room that they're going to make mistake after mistake after mistake. This is where mistakes are made because the only way to learn is by making a mistake and learning from them. So we celebrate them. We make it a big deal. And I make sure they know that they're going to make a ton of them. And I am too. And I'm really good at saying, okay, I just screwed up. Um, you know, and everybody's, yay, she gets to learn. So anyway, it's a, it's a really good way of thinking. It. So the next thing I want to talk about is we start our day with routine and we start it the same way every day. Daily greeting at the front door. Either I'm there or later on in the year, the students like to take this job. They like to take my job all the time. Anyway, and I let them because it's great for them. But they greet their peers at the door, say good morning, ask them how they're doing. The next step the kids do is they stop in and I have a place where they can check in on their zones of regulation. They stop and just reflect, are they in the green? Are they ready to learn today? Or gosh, are they really feeling tired? Um, so they're in the blue or are they like in the red because something really ticked them off on the bus and we need to solve a problem right away before school starts. It gives them that check-in time. It gives me the visual check-in time to know who I need to go meet with before our learning starts. Also, once we have pledged our flag, we do say our three personal standards and we pledge to use them every day. They always say, and they believe it wholeheartedly and I love it, that they are gonna use their three personal standards they pledge to do so, and they do it because they're the best third graders in the whole world. And they chirp it at me every single day, so I know they believe it. Next, we always end our day with routine, the same routine. Really try to build pride in our tools, in our learning environment, and we have taken lots of pride in not having the custodial staff have to come into our classroom to clean because we take care of it ourselves. Providing this time in the day, I know time is crucial, but I feel like it really builds on for the next day because during while they're cleaning, we're also prepping for what our morning is going to look like the next day. So students come in knowing what the expectations are and what they're going to be working on. My favorite part is our daily mantra that we do at the end of the day before we walk out to the buses. And I call out to my students and they call back and they tell me every day that they are leaders and readers and authors and mathematicians that they are amazing and then they make sure to tell me that they know their teacher loves them. So I think that those are super important things. The next thing I want to talk about is that integration of SEL. A lot of those things I just talked about, that's how you get it going. This is what it looks like throughout the day and throughout our learning during the day. I truly believe that second step, which is our SEL curriculum, should not be taught on Monday mornings from 10 to 10.30. I think that it's doing a disservice to our kids when we do that. What I try to do is now that there are standards, I will be pulling the standards and aligning that to, my, to the curriculum, but I pull out the main idea. And for example, if we are focusing on empathy this week, I make sure that empathy is just woven in and out of our day. And here's some ideas on how to do that. As a class, we decided that writing, we were struggling on writing good paragraphs. So we learned about writing good paragraphs and then we apply that practice every single day and I integrate our SEL focus. So for example, if it's empathy, the students have set up the classroom the day before, they come in and know that the writing prompt is, how are you going to show empathy today in your learning world? And they'll write a paragraph on that. So I think that that's a really good way to integrate. We use student scouts to find peers using the skills in the classroom and outside of the classroom. For example, I have a few little lanyards and in our school we use our currency is called positives and the students, I created leader, student leader positives and the students, we select a couple a week that will look for these traits in their peers. They see someone showing empathy, they reward them with a positive. Their favorite part is to do this work out at recess because they can find those behaviors in not just their classmates, but in everybody else out at recess. 
And I think it's something that's grown. I really loved seeing they come in and they set goals. I'm going to hand out 10 positives for empathy today out of recess. And when they reach those goals, they're pretty excited coming back in. We take the time to really practice all of this. And I think that that is for a teacher. That's really, really hard. Um, this was the hardest thing for me. I thought, oh, where am I going to take the time? How do I do this? But I do realize and have noticed and recognize in my students that when we take the time, it saves time in the end. When we take the time to learn how to line up, when we take the time to have the students talk about what they want their classroom expectations to be, they create them all. I do not. When we take the time to talk about what it looks like to be a, have distinguished behavior and specialist, they come up with those, they practice it, and we take that time. And I think it's super important. Each individual student has a student data binder, and it is a way for them to set goals around their academics, around their social emotional skills that they're working on and around their behaviors. They track their standards and where they are on those standards in this binder. Mondays are our days that we go into our student binders and just see where we're at. They just feed into this. They take ownership of their learning. And it, I really see a difference. And I hear conversations being said like, oh, last week I was working on, you know, multiply and divide. And gosh, this week I just rocked it. And I'm going to choose a different goal. The, the language and the vo student voice that you hear just completely fills your bucket. It's amazing. Um, we also really talk about our brains and how um, our brains work. What happens if our, our lid gets flipped in the classroom environment? What steps can we take? What should we do? Those are conversations that we have all the time, um, using our calming space, using our deep breathing, making sure that they know that if they're feeling this coming, that they are responsible and in control of their actions and they, they know the tools they can use to help them get through that, including using me. So the next thing I wanna talk about is I think the most important part about this whole entire thing, because if we don't have relationships with our kids, our kids are not gonna have the buy-in we want. They're not gonna take responsibility for their beha behaviors and their learning. And it's not always easy. It's sometimes very hard. There are those kids that you're like, oh, I need to just intentionally go in and build this relationship. But when you do it, the kids see it, they feel it. And then when it spreads into a community where they're building relationships with each other, and that's where the magic happens. So I wanna talk to you about some things that I do in the classroom that help me build relationships with kids and help peers build relationships with each other to build that classroom community. One, I wanna make sure that you guys know that I really look at the whole child and I don't look at just their ACEs. I don't just look at what the baggage that they're coming in the classroom with. I truly find, try to find what they are, what feeds them, what they're successful at, what leadership qualities they have. And I build off of that. And I think it's super important. Each week we choose learning partners. And those learning partners are people that we're going to sit next to for the week on the carpet. They're gonna be our turn and talk partners. They're also going to be the people that we practice giving feedback to and receiving feedback from. They also are the people that are there for the kids when they need help. They go to them first, if they academically, socially, anything like that. And the way I build this is I really have them look at themselves and what qualities do they have in themselves that would be make them a great learning partner. And then I have them actually look in others what qualities in others could help them become a better learner? So for example, if I have a kid that says, ah, I can't stop blurting, I need someone, I need to sit next to someone that has a really good at that and help me. But I am a great mathematician, so if anybody needs a math help, I'm their person. So I, that's been a great thing that I know that it's been successful in my classroom and I've seen students grow. Originally they'd pick their BFFs and now they're truly picking people that make them better leaders. We meet as classroom community every single morning. And we also, if there's drama in the classroom, we instantly stop what we're doing and we come together and talk to each other about what's going on. And I think this is where restorative practices come into play. And I've seen it work magic in my classroom. Once you build the expectations of what a, we call a fam our family circle, once you built that expectations of showing respect to the leader that's speaking, how to ask questions of the leader, how to contribute to the conversation, 
we practice that every morning. So when drama hits and we have to come together, those kids know exactly what to do. And we're just focused on helping solve a problem. I had a student this year that was very violent. We all have them. She had to be removed from the classroom. She went and did some restorative practices outside of the classroom and came back in. And we instantly, as soon as she walked in, the students in the classroom said, we need to circle up. We came together and we let her talk. She asked peers to talk. And I had a little girl say, you scared me. You made me feel unsafe in my classroom. And this young lady owned her business and they had a conversation and it was so powerful. It's so important. Lastly, we're leaders in our classroom from day one. We define what a leader is, what we look for in a leader. And we stop every time we see a leadership quality happening, especially a new one. If someone's really decided to take ownership and do something, we really celebrate that. Throwing a bunch of stuff at you. I want to go into the three things that I think that today in your Zoom calls, teachers, or hopefully let's pray, we're back in school in the fall. These are three things you can right away start. One, build those positive relationships. Make connections with your kids and guide them in making connections with each other. Believe in them so they believe in themselves. I've so many times said to kids, okay, I'm believing in you more than you're believing in yourself. We got to turn this around because when they believe in themselves, the academics go up, their behaviors improve, their social emotional learning is crazy and they're way more empathetic with others. It just makes such amazingness happen. Nurturing the whole child and making sure you give yourself and your students the grace of time to do so. Just look at everybody holistically and take the time. If it's an academic lesson that has to stand, go back on the back burner for 15, 20 minutes, nurture that whole child and bring it back. And I promise you'll make up time in the end. And lastly, to me, the most important is to empower students. I let my kids know that I can't make them do anything. I can't make them behave. I cannot make them a learner. I cannot do anything, but I can be their biggest cheerleader and coach them. I can give them the learning. I can have the, facilitate the learning that they need to reach their goals, but it's completely their choice to do so. And when you give them that ownership and then you watch them, I've had kids say, okay, I'm not doing it today. Okay. And then all of a sudden they'll look around at their peers that have made the choice to do something and they are, they make the choice themselves. And I guarantee that learning is going to be way more valuable and they're going to just grow from that than me just making them do something. So coach them to be leaders, coach them to, to take ownership of their learning, of their behaviors and their emotions, and believe that they are capable. One last thing before I let you go. This is my first year in third grade and going into third grade, I went in and the big thing on my mind was SBA. And I had to really self-reflect and stop. I had to think SBA, if I think of it as something scary or something my kids can't do, or something that's just virtually impossible, they're not ready for, then they're not gonna believe that they can do it. And they have to do it. It is the end in mind. They have to be able to show those skills on this assessment. So in our class, I changed my mindset and I decided that at the very beginning, I was gonna say, you have this big thing. We're not gonna call it a test. We're not gonna call it an assessment. We're gonna call it a show what you know. And we're gonna work every day to build everything you need to rock the assessment at the end. And I have to tell you that I did it. We did it, we worked, we used interims, we used pre and post, we guided ourselves and set goals. And when COVID hit, my first Zoom meeting with my kids, first kid that raised his hand after our expectations for Zoom meetings were set, said, Mrs. Collins, does this mean we're not doing the SBA? And I said, yes. It does. We are not doing the SBA this year. The entire group in unison unclicked their mutes and said, oh, they were devastated. So we didn't get to do the SBA and I don't know what the, that, those results would have been, but I know that my kids wanted to show what they know and they had taken ownership in that short little time that I had with them in the classroom. And I believe that we can do it through Zoom. I believe we can do it when we're back in the classrooms. And I am so thankful that I got to share this with you guys today.
Thank you very much. Thank you, Jessica. Awesome presentation. Such great information for people. We do have some resources that we wanted to share. And Tammy, do you want to take a moment and tell us about these resources? You'll see the Washington documents. There are the SEL standards, benchmarks, and indicators. That will take you right to them. There's also an amazing document that the work group, the SEL work group created the implementation guide. It not only does it talk about best practices and strategies and help you develop an, an amazing SEL program, but it also provides all kinds of resources within it. And in addition, if you need a high level, something to share with someone who maybe is not aware of SEL, these are the SEL briefs are geared towards, say, educators or educational leaders. There's one toward for parents. There's one for youth-serving organizations. There's one on equ equity and culturally responsiveness. So those are one to two page that gives a high-level overview. And then the SEL modules, can't recommend this high enough. These are free modules that you can go into. You'll see that there are six segments of them. The trauma-informed is the fifth segment, but people were asking in the Q&A about professional development. This is one way to do it. There's the OSPI SEL website that has all of the documents and resources that the SEL previous work groups have created, and there is a plethora of those. Then there's the CASA website, the kind of gold standard. They have all kinds of resources for you. And then the Center to Improve SEL and School Safety. Thank you so much, Tammy. Those are awesome. If people do want to email, we're available for that. You can still get in touch with us if your questions didn't get answered today. Thanks for coming today. 